trauma will never be a competition. We don't get trophies for trauma. So what we do get is to keep living. Your trauma is not worse or better than mine. It exists. It changed you. And nobody will ever understand that except you. So we can't really compare them. We just have to allow them to exist. Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Mindful Evolution Podcast. I am Leah Drew, your host, and today I have here a fantabulous human being who has just impressed me across the board. Uh, I have Amanda Blackwood with me today. Amanda is an author of 13 books, the most popular being Custom Justice, she is also the host of The Survivors, a podcast that spotlights incredible humans sharing their stories of gaining resiliency through surviving traumatic experiences. Amanda is also the survivor of human trafficking, and it's one of the things that we're going to dive into and talk about today um, and giving her a space to share her story with you And so I'm really excited. Amanda, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. I'm excited to get to hang out with you again. It's been a little while. (laughs) Same. I love your energy. And and I did the moment that we met. um, So Amanda and I met at a recent conference called Podcast Movement, which was surprisingly all about podcasts. (laughs) (laughs) Imagine that. And Amanda and I were introduced by Alex and his wife. Remind me of her name. Alicia. Alicia, yes. And just like instantly loved your energy, loved your vibe, loved your red lipstick. (laughs) And we started talking about what we do and trauma came up and the mind-body connection came up. And we just like instantly were like, oh, wow, like we've got some stuff to talk about here. So yeah, I'm excited to like dive into some of that today and also like personally hear a little bit more about your story. Your story has been very moving for me and just the courage and the resiliency and what it is that you have moved through in your life to get to where you are today. I I would love to just give you some space to share a little bit of your background with our listener. Okay. Uh, So as with most survivors of human trafficking, we grow up in these environments that are rather abusive. Uh, I'm certainly no stranger to that myself. My mother was mentally and emotionally abusive. My father was physically abusive. And my older brother was sexually abusive. The first time I ever remember being molested, I was four. I grew up uh, in this environment with feeling like I was the scapegoat. I was the youngest of the family. Everything was blamed on me and everything was my fault. And I believed that everything was my fault because it kept happening to me. So when I was 12, 13, 15, 16, I was molested by other people, not just my brother. They were strangers at the swimming pool. One was an uncle by marriage. I mean, all these different people, a total stranger in a parking lot one day, nobody did anything. So I kept on having these experiences where I was being abused. My mother kept on telling me that if things kept happening to me, that I was the common denominator and there was something wrong with me. My father used to believe that I was uh, sexually active long before I actually was and would spread rumors and lies about me to his friends. I felt completely alone in the world. There was nobody I could turn to. There was nobody I could tell. I was a teenage runaway at 15. I did everything I could trying to change my own circumstances, but how do you change your circumstances at that age? You know, you keep getting dragged back to your own home. You keep getting dragged back into these situations. By the time I was 17, I was raped by somebody I thought was my best friend. And I was still friends with him afterward because I didn't know any better. I eventually started looking for love and acceptance wherever I could find it. And that meant primarily outside of my home. 
When I was 18, I was dating a man and living with a man who was more than twice my age in a state uh, away from my parents. And this man was the first person who ever trafficked me. So I was trafficked three different times in my life. What a lot of people don't recognize is that the majority of people that are put into human trafficking or coerced into human trafficking are trafficked at minimum seven different times. The fact that I was only trafficked three different times is a bit of a miracle. But it's also important to understand what human trafficking actually is. So it's not something that I would suggest people go out and necessarily Google or look up on Wikipedia because these are fallible resources. They can change based on who it is that's adding input from what part of the world. So I always tell people, look for the definition on the Department of Homeland Security. Their definition says that human trafficking is the use of force, fraud, or coercion to obtain commercial sex acts or labor from another person. So if you notice, there's no mention of transportation because human smuggling and human trafficking are two separate issues, even though they overlap a lot. There's no mention of money. It says commercial sex acts, but that doesn't always mean money. So human trafficking does not equal prostitution, and prostitution is not always human trafficking. The majority is, but not all. There's no mention of age. So it doesn't say that you have to be under the age of 18 to be a victim of trafficking, even though we automatically think of most trafficking victims as people under the age of 18 that are being snatched up by total strangers and windowless vans. The truth is shocking. The real truth is that the oldest person in recent years to be pulled out of trafficking here in Colorado was in her 70s. The youngest was three months old. There is nobody that is completely invulnerable. It's the most bizarre world that we live in when a survivor of trafficking doesn't recognize it themselves. And that's who I was. So here I was at 18 years old living with a man who was more than twice my age, who traded me away to his buddy for I'm not sure what, but there was definitely some kind of compensation in return. I believe it was drugs. So this friend of his, I'd known him for a little while, uh, said that he was going to have a birthday party in Las Vegas, and I was invited to go. The way it was pitched to me, I was going to get an all-expenses-paid trip to Las Vegas, I was only 18. I knew I wasn't going to be able to gamble, but I wanted to ride the, the roller coaster on top of New York, New York. Love that thing. I couldn't wait to go. So this man, um, let's call him Carlo. Carlo had my driver's my ID card. I didn't have a driver's license yet. And we went to the airport. We got on a plane. He held on to my ID card. We got to Vegas. He continued holding on to my ID card. And when we checked into the Hard Rock Hotel... The front desk staff was paid extra money to not ask questions. And by that, they were told that I was allowed to have room service only once a day. They were to drop it off outside of the room and walk away before I opened up the door. They were not to make any contact with me. And if they did all of this very well, that he would tip them extra in the end. This was so they wouldn't know who I was or what was going on. I did not have a key to the room. Without a key to the room, I couldn't leave the room at all. And I was told by Carlo that if I left the room, I would not be allowed back in. He still had my ID card. I wouldn't be able to really go for help. I was in a state away from where all of my things were. My family didn't care about me, so I couldn't ask for help. I was alone, and over a period of 52 hours, I received food once a day, was raped and molested. He would fall asleep and eat a few bites of food and go back downstairs and gamble again. This was this cycle of this 52-hour period, and I didn't know until just a few years ago that that was actually considered human trafficking because by the definition, force, fraud, or coercion to obtain labor or commercial sex acts from another person. That's exactly what happened. I had to stick around. I couldn't walk out of that room and go to the police. For one, the police were the ones who kept on dragging me back home when I was a kid being abused. I didn't trust the cops. And for two, if I left that room and the cops didn't believe me, I had nothing. I had no way back to Arizona I had nobody waiting for me once I got back. 
I, I already had very little. Was I going to lose what little I did have? So I put up with what it was going on for this 52 hour period and I made it back to Arizona and I got my stuff and as quickly as I possibly could, I found somewhere else to stay and I got out. But just because you get out of a bad situation doesn't mean that that bad situation doesn't follow you. And he stalked me and followed me for years. Eventually, I found my way down the very next year to Florida. I had injured myself on a job in Arkansas. And I went to Florida to go get knee surgery. I was going to go there and stay with my dad's mother, my grandmother. I'd never really spent a whole lot of time with her. So I really didn't know my grandmother very well. And I was going to fix that while going through knee surgery with some of the best knee surgeons in the country. My job was paying for everything and I didn't have very much money. So I was excited to go and just kind of hang out with her for a little while. Well, I got all this stuff taken care of. And I got to the bus station to Daytona Beach at around 1030 at night. I had maybe five dollars left in my name. And I used some pocket change to use a payphone to call my grandmother. So I told her, you know, hey, I'm here. I'm ready to come and be picked up so I can come and stay with you. And her husband, my dad's stepfather, answered the phone and said, we're not coming to get you. You're on your own. Good luck. And I sat down on the curb of a bus station in a strange city I had not been to since I was four. And I cried my eyes out. And a young couple came up and found me and they asked me what was wrong. I don't know how they understood what I was saying through all those sobs, but they they got the gist of it, I guess. And this young couple, he was 22. She looked about 18. She was 15. They told me that they had a place for me to stay until I could get on my feet if I just went with them. But what they really meant was they had a place where I could stay until they found the highest bidder because they sold me to a guy named Esteban for an estimate of $90 for my entire life. That's what I was worth. I was locked up in a small room for 23 and a half hours with no food, no water, no bathroom facilities, no way out. A combination lock on the outside of the door, bars on the windows, a window that had been bricked up. I fought so hard to get my way out of there. But I grew up a child of the 80s. And I loved watching MacGyver. And watching that TV show is what saved my life. The man could fix anything with a paperclip and a rubber band. I once saw him strap a piece of dynamite to a rat's tail (laughs) and blow up an entire wall without injuring the rat. I knew I could work my way out of this situation. And that's exactly what I did. And when I got out, I ran and I didn't look back. And there were others that had been locked up in that place too. Not in the same room as me, but other rooms. And I didn't go back for them. So I had this overwhelming sense of survivor's guilt for a long time. You know, I could have done more. I could have saved them. I could have gone back for them. And I've wrestled with this for a long time. But number one, I was scared. And number two, if I had gone back for them, I might not be alive right now. How did you get out? I tried everything. (laughs) So... Uh, there was it, there was a small bed and a couch and a little table with a lamp and it looked like somebody's bedroom. And I started doing everything I could to work my way out. And the window had a board over it and I broke fingernails and shredded them off of my hands trying to pull this wooden board off the window. And when I got it off is when I found the bars and then the bricks on the outside. I wasn't getting out that way. But I was still willing to do whatever it took to try to work my way out. I found a very old, very dull serrated edge knife underneath a pile of dirty clothes under the bed. And I used that to cut a hole in the door. And it took me something, some stupid number of hours. I don't even remember anymore. Somewhere between 8 and 12 hours to cut a hole just big enough for my hand to fit out. And when I did, I actually... um, scarred my hand slightly with shoving my hand through the wood in the door. It dug into my skin and ripped a hole in the back of my hand. I still have that scar to this day. When I reached out, trying to get to the lock so I could pull the lock off the door and get out, that was how I discovered that it was actually a combination lock. There was no way I was going to be able to get out of a combination lock. I've had 
uh, panic nightmares of combination locks like on school lockers since then. Then uh, I took all those dirty clothes out from underneath that bed and I piled them up on the couch and I made basically what looked like a dummy. <laughs> I covered it over with the bed sheet and then I hid underneath that little table with the lamp on it. And I stayed there, crouched in a very awkward position until they came back to check on me. And when he came into the room, I had fallen asleep and he almost stepped on my hand. And if he'd stepped on my hand, not only would I have been biting my tongue not to shout, but he would have felt something under his foot and he would have looked and he very nearly stepped on my hand. But he saw the dummy on the couch and he started creeping over towards that dummy to uh, go see if I was okay. <laughs> and when he did, I climbed out from under the table. And when I stood up to try and run out the door, I bumped the table with my head and then my shoulder and the lamp on it started to sway all over the place. And he heard the noise and everything and he turned around and he started coming after me. And as he was lunging, I'm right handed, but I knew my left hand was closer to the lamp and I reached around behind me for the lamp and I brought it right up right across his face he stumbled and he dropped the lock and I wanted to grab the lock and, and you know run out the door and lock him in there so that I could get the cops but I knew I didn't have that kind of time and that's way too heroic and I just wasn't a hero <laughs> and I just ran I ran as hard as I could uh, straight out of this really dark building and into broad daylight. I didn't realize how long I'd been there. I thought it was dark outside. And this light hurt my eyes. And the first person I saw was a cop. And she didn't believe me. I was in probably the worst area of Daytona Beach at the time. So when I flagged her down and started trying to tell her everything, I'm sure she probably thought I was high. I wasn't. I was hungry. I was thirsty. And I was scared. But I wasn't high. And she looked at me like I'd just grown an extra head. But then she saw him do an illegal U-turn in his car while he was coming after me. He did this illegal U-turn because he saw me talking to a cop. And she saw that and then she went after him. And I never looked it up to find out if they had gotten him or if they'd gotten anybody else out of there. I never went back in any way. It took me 20 years to even admit that this whole thing had even happened. It was actually my first book that I ever published in 2017. It's called Detailed Pieces of a Shattered Dream. But it talks about hearing the other voices down that hall and how they haunted me for a long, long time. And I wondered how many of them ever made it out, if they made it out at all. A few years ago, I learned a statistic that kind of makes me think that they probably didn't make it. Less than 2% of all victims of human trafficking get out with their lives. Of the 2% that survive, so if you make it past their first year, because the suicide rates and the retaliation rates are astronomical. Less than 2%, that's insane. Yeah. Yeah. But I made it out. I mean, not just... Once or twice, but three times. You don't want to do the math on that. <laughs> so I, I floated around for a while after that. I've never been back to Florida since then. I've been invited a few times. I've never been. Eventually, I made my way out to California because that's about as far as you can get away from Florida without having a passport. <laughs> and I lived in L.A. for a while. When I moved there, I was 24 years old. I was still young and I was ready to do amazing things with my life. I desperately wanted to be the executive assistant to somebody important because that would mean that I was important. That's what I meant by doing something important with my life. If I was important to somebody else, that's what mattered to me then. Instead, I Worked as a server here and there and was on Alias and Will and Grace and modeled for Harley Davidson. And I did a lot of really cool stuff. But I never became that executive assistant. Eventually, I started messing around with the world of internet dating. Because that became a big thing in 2004. And I met this man who lived in another country. But we 
we became pretty close friends pretty quickly and we got to know each other pretty well. So his name, uh, we'll call him Richard. That's what I called him in my book. And Richard uh, lived in Scotland. So he had this beautiful accent. He had a beautiful daughter. He had a beautiful life. And I had at that point come to trust police officers maybe a little bit more. And he had a career as a police officer. He was a great guy. But I had a career and a life in L.A. And he had a career and a life over there in Scotland. So all we would ever be, we decided, was pen pals. And over a period of seven years, he saw me go from being on TV shows and stuff to becoming a mall cop to within five months of starting that job. I busted open a major embezzlement ring. I became the director of public safety and security for that property and then five others at the same time. So I was in charge of six properties. I got an $11,000 a year raise. I got raises for all of my employees. I was on a winning streak. I bought my first car without having a co-signer. I had my first apartment all by myself with no roommates. I even had a cat. I had come a long way. I had really grown into figuring out who I was. And it, it we knew each other, he and I, for seven years. He came over to visit me eventually. I went over to go and visit him. I absolutely loved Scotland. It was such a great place. And it took him seven years to finally ask me to get a fiancé visa, essentially asked me to marry him and move to Scotland to be with him forever. And I gave up not just, I had my own assistant at that point, <laughs> not just my assistant and my job, but my car and my apartment. And I gave everything up, sold what I could, flew, threw away whatever I didn't fit into my suitcase. And I flew to Scotland on a fiancé visa to go be with him. It took him seven years to get me there. It took him seven days to start trafficking me. Oh my goodness. It was heartbreaking. And no no signs of of anything of any trafficking from him over the 7 years. No signs of anything like that. There were some red flags that I did not see or acknowledge because I wasn't healed enough to notice them yet. Um he did have some controlling and some manipulative behaviors, but I just dismissed them. They were uh, nothing near what I had grown up with. And I knew what I'd grown up with was abusive. But if this wasn't as bad as that, surely this wasn't abusive. And did he know about your past with him, with being trafficked previously? Neither of us were uh, familiar with trafficking enough at that point to be able to say that that's what it was. But he did know that I had been a uh, survivor of kidnapping in Florida when I was 19. And I hadn't told him or really anyone about what happened to me when I lived in Arizona. Nobody knew that except for the people who did it to me. I actually didn't come out with that story until three years ago. I kept it inside all those years. The Scotland story or the Arizona story? The Arizona story. So Scotland, I tried talking about it as soon as I left there. But I mean... Scotland was tough. Scotland was really tough. And you know how we do this thing to ourselves where we tell ourselves, I can get through this. I've been through worse. Yeah. We got to stop saying that. <laughs> it nearly killed me. It nearly took my life. In what ways? Really quickly, I wanted to get out of Scotland. Yeah, you know, The first seven days were great. But after that, the abuse got so bad that I just, I needed out. He had my passport, my driver's license, my debit card, all that stuff. I knew that I wasn't going to be able to get access to that without having a really solid plan. So one night while the abuse was happening, I kept on making sure that his whiskey glass was full. Got him completely plastered. Uh, I got him so drunk that he forgot to take photos towards the end of the evening, which was a good thing because he took photos and videos of everything. Everything. <laughs> and... When I, when I got him that drunk that night, I conned him into giving me back my stuff. I told him, I said, you know, if I have my, my debit card and my passport, I can go down to the bank tomorrow and I can go pull all of my money out of the bank so I can give it to you so we can spend it and we can do stuff with it. Because otherwise it's just going to sit in the bank forever. I only had a little over $2,000, but $2,000 is still money. 
And I told him this, and that night before going to sleep, he pulled that stuff out of his little mini safe, and he gave it to me. And what I did with it the next day, rather than going down to the bank, was I jumped on the computer and bought myself an emergency flight home. First flight out was over $12,000. I couldn't afford that. Second flight out was too expensive. I had to go day by day by day looking up every single flight, everything possible to be able to find out what's the first trip out of here that I can afford. And the first one out was five days away. And I told myself, it's okay. I've been through worse than this. I can make it through this too. In that five days, the abuse escalated so much that I ended up with a kidney infection that landed me in the hospital and I nearly died. I had not been through anything like this in my life. And yet that was my mantra. I've been through worse. I can get through this too. It was such a dangerous thing to say. I said the same thing to myself in that hotel room in Las Vegas when I was living in Arizona. I've been through worse. I can get through this too. What if I had left? What if that wasn't my mantra? What if I had found somebody that I could talk to that might be able to help me and get me out of this situation? There's organizations out there for people specifically like me that needed it. But I wasn't aware of that at the time. You know, when I was in Arizona, that was 1998. When I was in Florida, that was 1999. The words human trafficking really didn't exist. If they did, nobody knew it. Here I was in Scotland. It was 2011. People still weren't talking about what human trafficking was. If they were, it only happened to little kids in windowless vans. It didn't happen to somebody who was 31 years old and had moved halfway around the world to go be with somebody that they had known for seven years. That's not what human trafficking was. To a lot of people, that's still not what human trafficking is. But that is the textbook definition of it. Eventually, I tried to... I was going to ask, do you think that some people see, or how do I want to say this, in most people's minds, do you think that there's a difference between human trafficking and being in an abusive relationship? Like, and what are the differences to you between those two? Well, being in a, hum- a, a an abusive relationship typically does not involve outsiders. So human trafficking, what it comes down to is, you know, back to that same same definition Domestic violence a lot of times takes on a lot of the same aspects. The use of force, fraud, coercion to obtain something from that person. But if it's not commercial sex acts, which means basically sex uh, against your will outside of this specific relationship or labor, um, working in the fields or working as a house servant or maid without compensation or without a choice, that's when it starts to kind of cross that line. And there are a lot of people that are forced into being a swinger and they don't want it. They don't want that in a relationship. But you know what? That is human trafficking. That is forced fraud or coercion to obtain commercial sex acts. Basically, you're having a commercial sex act if you're having sex outside of your relationship uh, by somebody else's force. There are a lot of boundaries that are crossed in relationships specifically in domestic violence relationships and they do get a bit blurred sometimes and it can be really hard to distinguish what they are but if it doesn't fit that definition of what human trafficking is then it's not actually human trafficking and it's still something that needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed quickly And so when you were in Scotland, were you only being abused by one individual or were there multiple individuals in Scotland? He, I call it a revolving door. He had a revolving door. He advertised me on a swingers website and on a dating website known, very well known around the world, Plenty of Fish. Mm -hmm. Um, He would put up my photos and he would write a description supposedly coming from my point of view. This is important to remember, too. Um, Supposedly, it was me saying that I wanted these things to happen and I was looking for couples. So not only was it a revolving door, 
But it wasn't just men that were abusing me. It was men and women, and a lot of them. There were times that it was five, six, seven days a week. And there were times that it was multiple people. There were, uh, he, he did work five days a week as a police officer. He really was a police officer. And he was a police officer who was a resource officer in, I believe, an elementary school. He was around kids all day, every day. But when he wasn't there, he was at home and I was getting abused. I was the servant. I did have to cook and clean. So I was also labor trafficked. Um, I did have to do all of the laundry. Um, I had to clean the house. If I didn't do it the exact right way or if there was dust on something, I would get into trouble. And sometimes that meant not having food. Sometimes it meant um, sleep deprivation. The longest I went without sleep was eight and a half days. And I am a survivor of something called sport torture. So I was held down and waterboarded to see what would happen. I mean, <laughs> you want to talk about force, fraud, or coercion. These are the things that would happen if I didn't do what was being told I was going to do. If I had a say in performing sex acts for other people, like a trained circus monkey, I wouldn't do them. Absolutely not. But I had that, that force and I had that coercion. I had that fraud going on. And if I'd left, I had nowhere to go. Now, again, he was a cop. I couldn't exactly go to the police and say, hi, I need help. <laughs> I have a police officer that's abusing me because they're all cops. He was also bringing over as his guests uh, lawyers, judges, other police officers, people he met in a grocery store. You never know who somebody was. There was one night that there was a woman there that I believe the same thing was happening to her. And I tried to confide in her. I'm so tired. I can't keep doing this. I'm exhausted. It was somewhere around 4.30 in the morning. And she told me, just pretend to be asleep. I'll tell them you passed out. And I did. I laid there with my eyes closed and I pretended to be asleep. And they, the two men came back into the room and they said, oh, hey, what's she doing asleep? You need to wake her up. And she said, no, she's tired. Just leave her alone. Just leave her alone. And they wouldn't. They didn't. And it was the first time somebody had really tried to help me. So sometime later, after I had gotten out, I tried to report him to the authorities, to the Strathclyde Police Department in Scotland and let them know what had happened. And they asked me for details and they wanted names and they wanted dates and times and specifics on what happened. And when you get out of this trauma, a lot of times you've got this Swiss cheese brain. You've got all these holes in your memory and you cannot remember these things no matter how hard you try. And this is something that police even now don't truly understand about abuse and human trafficking and rape and violence. The well, only, that's what trauma does. It, yeah. it bypasses the frontal lobe of your brain and it prevents you from being able to piece together proper memories. And right. so it ends up being these black holes where it's like you know this thing happened, but the memory of it is so is so clouded. Right. Right. And the only name that I could remember when they asked me for names was the name of the lady who was nice to me that night. That was it. And I have to give credit to Caroline because she gave me that little bit of hope. She couldn't do anything to help me, but she tried. Just a little. And that was more than what anybody else had done. And how did that instance and experience of her helping you at the time, how did that act as a catalyst for you moving forwards? Well, I tried to take my own life after that. Um, because while she did try to help me, I also recognized it as a failure to help me. Uh, she wasn't capable of speaking up and speaking out. And I knew that if I did, 
worse things would happen to me. I had already been threatened multiple times. I'd already had sport torture. You know, I'd had these crazy things happen. If I spoke up, things would just get worse for me. So I tried to take my own life one day at a train station. And I didn't go through with it because a four-year-old child about there walked out onto the platform after I had been wandering around town all day that day, just praying that somebody would just see me. And not just look at me, but actually see me. And people saw me and they ignored me and they would look at me and look away. And I could see this whole not my circus, not my monkeys mentality on every one of them because obviously I was having a very bad day. I was in constant tears. I probably looked really pale. I hadn't seen the sun in days at that point. Of course, it's Scotland. Nobody does. Uh, <laughs> but I made my way all the way down to the train station just completely desperate. And I was a smoker at the time. And this man asked me for a light for his cigarette because I was sitting there smoking. And I handed him my light and I told him, you can keep it. I won't be needing it anymore. And I said it very intentionally because I wanted him to ask why. And he didn't ask. But that little kid was his. And that little kid, when he came out onto the platform, he looked at me. And he looked right through me. And he saw me and he saw the pain in my eyes and his little face squirreled up like he was truly concerned. And you know how we do as adults when we see a little kid that's worried about us, we try to cheer up and act like we're just fine because we don't want the kid to be upset because we're upset. He saw right through me. At four, this kid saw my right through me. And I knew that I could not do to this child what had been done to me so many years ago. Because somebody took away my innocence when I was four and had abused me. It set me up for this long string of horrible failures and repeated traumas. And I couldn't do that to this kid. And he was the only reason that I didn't commit suicide that day. And I was excited and happy to be running back to my prison because I knew in that moment that if I was going to be kept alive through everything that I'd been through, that there had to be a reason and that my life had to mean more than this. And I wasn't just going to die some nameless, faceless mess on the front of a train. And so I put together a plan and I actually got out and I escaped with my life just barely. But while I was there in Scotland, I was only there for five months. I lost 78 pounds in five months. I lost my dignity, my self-respect. I lost my will to live. I lost friends. I lost the people that I thought were my family. I lost everything. And when I got back, it didn't just stop just because I got away. Just like in Arizona, it didn't stop just because I got away. He relentlessly pursued me. He found out where I was working. So he sent all these photos and videos to my boss. All the ones that he had taken when the guests were coming over. Rape videos. And my boss was somebody that I had known for 14 years. And this guy had the, had the balls... <laughs> To tell me that this was something that I was into and interested in, that he could help me to make that happen. He didn't see it as abuse. He saw it as me being that person that was portrayed. And I left that job and that friendship after 14 years of being friends with this person. It destroyed that friendship. But then he did it again. And again, and again, I sent this stuff to landlords. I nearly lost my home. He sent it to other friends. I lost friendships. And one particular friend who was my best friend at the time, she couldn't understand how something like that could happen to somebody who was 31 years old without my permission. She said, you had to have complied with this. 
for it to happen in the first place because there's no way something like this could happen without you being a willing participant. And she started telling people that I had been a high-priced call girl because she didn't know how to deal with it. And I lost that friendship too. I was so alone. And I wandered around and I went from job to job just trying to survive. Eventually, all that happened in 2011 and it kept on following me. Eventually in 2016, I moved out here to Colorado. I figured if I start over, maybe I get a better shot. And this guy had a hard time finding me anymore. He couldn't find out who I was working for. He couldn't find out who my friends were now. Everything was different. Everything was new. Surely my life is going to get better now, right? And it did. And it got continually better, a little bit better every year. And then in 2019, which was not that long ago, he made me famous on a pornography website. He had taken all these photos and videos and he'd put them on this pornography website and linked every bit of my social media that he could find. I didn't know how to deal with it. I wasn't sure I wanted to deal with it. I was pretty sure I just wanted to check out. This was never going to stop, is what I told myself. I stopped telling myself that I'd been through worse because everything was new every single time it happened. It's not worse, it's not better. It's not a competition. It's not a destination. Everything was just terrible. <laughs> so I reached out to an anti-trafficking organization out here in Colorado. They paired me up with pro bono legal services to immediately start contacting these pornography websites and having this stuff pulled down. And then they paired me up with a therapist. I traumatized this poor woman so much that she's left the industry and she's done with therapy forever. So then they had to pair me up with another one. But this one, the second one, had worked with other survivors of human trafficking. She was trauma-informed, which is really important. Very important. <coughs> and I told her right out of the gate, number one, don't come at me with prescription medication. I'm not looking for a Band-Aid. I need a shovel. Number two, don't treat me like I'm fragile, like I'm breakable. If I was going to break, I'd have done it already. I've got a lot of work to do, and we need to get started. I hear a lot of power in, in those words. She was good. I mean, she was, she was a phenomenal therapist. It was about a year and a half in. She had helped me to get over a lot of these speed bumps. She helped me to figure out where my roadblocks were. And towards the end of that, she says, you know, I don't think that there's much more that I could do to help you, but what are you going to do to help yourself? Because I know that you're, you're not done working on things. I know this. I said, you know, I think I'm ready to write my book. And she says, well, you already have a few, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I do. But I, I haven't written the book. And she said, all right, well, it's it's uh, late November. So how about I check in with you in early January? And if you need me between now and then, I'm here. You can always reach out to me. I'm like, All right, that sounds good. She says, well, we'll check in and see how everything's going. So January came around. She asked me, she said, so how's it going? I said, oh, I'm doing great. How are you doing? She said, no, that's not what I asked. I said, how's it going? How's the book going? Did you get started on it yet? Do you have a title for it yet? And I told her, Amy, it's done. <laughs> I wrote the entire 350 page autobiography in the month of December of 2020. It was so fast and it just, it just flowed. It just all poured out of me. It was nuts. So she asked me, well, now what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. She said, I have an idea. I want you to try painting. I told her every time I've ever tried to paint, it looks like a multicolored snowman laying down on his side. I am not a good painter. That's a bad idea. She said, I don't care what you've done in the past. I want you to try now. It doesn't matter what it looks like. 
It just matters that you're able to express yourself. So she sent somebody over with canvases, paintbrushes, paints, all the good stuff. Within three months, I'd sold my first piece. And that was to the organization that paired me up with her in the first place. They made prints of it and sold the prints to be able to pay for counseling and therapy for other survivors of trafficking. That is so beautiful. Within five months, I had sold my art internationally. <laughs> One piece hangs in a home for human trafficking survivors in Chicago, Illinois. And it talks about how we all have to carry our own baggage through life before we find a safe place to set it down. The Chicago Tribune uh, wrote an article then, and interviewed me for it because this painting was unveiled at the opening of this home. And that was June of 2021. It was the same month that my autobiography was published. And one month before I met the man that's now my husband. I, I think it's it's so beautiful to see how you've navigated so much challenge and trauma and intensity in your world and been able to transmute it through these modalities of self-expression, through your voice, through painting, through writing, which can be such healing modalities to work with trauma and to work with challenge and to work with the, the big and the hard feelings and emotions and experiences and to have that be redistributed in a way that helps others recognize what is possible for them and what can be on the other side of that darkness is so beautiful and so powerful. Thank you. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've heard this over and over again, but I'm, I'm so sorry for what, what's happened to you. No one should ever have to navigate anything like that. And I'm so grateful that you're here and that I get to speak with your beautiful energy and that I get to hear your voice and see your amazing artwork on, on the walls behind you. <laughs> that one's actually right. about to sell too. Oh, you found a, you found a buyer. I have a bidding war going on right now. I found three buyers. <laughs> Ooh, I love that for you. <laughs> but you know, so, I will I will never be sorry for it happening to me because knowing the statistic of knowing that less than 2% get out with their lives, I did. If it hadn't been me, it would have been somebody else and they probably wouldn't be alive today. If they were alive today, the chances of them being able to speak about it are pretty slim. I'm sure to you, give it a voice. It shows you the courage and the strength that, that you have and that you've been able to find in you. And, and again, like those words that I I heard earlier that you said to your therapist, there was so much power in that. And to be able to find that, and in many ways I can I can resonate with this, to be, you know, shoved down by so much trauma and so much darkness and so much challenge and feel like you don't know how to get yourself out of it to find yourself in a place of this deep knowing within yourself and to step into that power that you have within you is a life-changing experience and I I see that in you like I see how much transformation you've moved through I see how much you've chosen to change your life. And that's that in my opinion is is the most important word there is that it's it's a choice. You chose to make a change. You chose to do something different. You chose to carry yourself in a different way. You chose to escape. You chose to find help and support. You chose to stand up and speak about what you've navigated and what you've been through. And that's so honorable. And you're, you're stepping forward as a leader for so many people that have navigated human trafficking, that have navigated trauma in any way, shape, or form to, to really be an example for them, to, to see what's possible, to see what's on the other side. And darkness can get really, really dark sometimes. 
but when you can find that power and that light within yourself to shine into that darkness, it illuminates aspects of yourself that you you didn't even know existed. And I, I love being able to speak to this beautiful, powerful woman in front of me that has such a strong story, a personal story. And, you know, I know for me something that I, I don't often share, but I feel it's very relevant to this conversation. When I was in high school, um, I was sex sexually exploited myself through photographs. And there were two individuals in my high school that got their hands on these, these nude photos of me and handed them out to my entire high school, printed out hundreds and hundreds of copies, posted them on lockers, um, handed them out in the cafeteria, anywhere they could. And it, it's something that I always look back at. And, you know, the majority of people don't make it through something like that and recognize how much power and how much opportunity and how much strength they still have within them. And unfortunately, these types of things are so common around us everywhere from human trafficking to sexual exploitation to ex exploitation to to rape and sexual abuse. Like, like it's insane going through yeah. college. Same. I was sexually assaulted by two different men going through college. One of them also my friend. One of them a bartender. And... There's people will always try in your life to take away your power. They will always try. And usually it's the people that feel powerless themselves. And regardless of what happens to you, regardless of regardless of the circumstances, you always have a choice to reconnect with that power within you. Always. Yeah. And my experiences are, are nothing in comparison to the extent of what you have experienced. And in many ways, it, it helps me be able to sit here and relate with you. And I feel that so many women can sit here and relate to so many, to some aspect of your experience. And that's, that's powerful to be able to have that opportunity because through that it, it can change lives. And you know, I'm I'm very interested for you to express and, and explain here, like through all of the challenge that you've navigated, through all of this challenge that you've experienced in your life, the trauma, the trafficking, what has this taught you? What has this led you to step forwards with? Like, what knowing has this given you? Oh, there's so much. Probably the first one is that trauma will never be a competition. We don't get trophies for trauma. So what we do get is to keep living. Your trauma is not worse or better than mine. It exists. It changed you. And nobody will ever understand that except you. So we can't really compare them. We just have to allow them to exist. I also learned that the phrase, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, is a huge lie that was um, made up by a man by the name of Frederick Nietzsche in the late 1800s. He died in an insane asylum sometime after that. The truth is that the strength is already within us. We don't need to be giving this credit to our abusers and the people that have hurt us and the events that have hurt us. Our traumas do not make us stronger. Our traumas hurt us and reform us and change us forever. What makes us stronger is our resiliency and our will to live. Stop giving credit to the past, to the abusers. And probably the biggest one, the hardest thing, that I've ever done is accept apologies that I will never receive. Because when it comes down to it, we do not need to put our mental health 
and our ability to move forward back in the hands of the people who have hurt us in the first place. Why are we waiting for apologies from these people? They don't deserve to be in our life, much less have anything to do with our healing or our journey forward after everything that we've been through. We have to accept this apology, though, because we have to be able to move on. Otherwise, we are bonded to these people for life through our anger, through our frustration, through our hatred for them. And people ask me all the time, how can you forgive the person who did this to you? It's very easy if you understand what forgiveness means. It is not a pardon. If you were to kick me by accident as we're standing in an elevator, you would say, oh, I'm sorry. And I would say, oh, that's okay. That is a pardon. That is not forgiveness. That is a pardon. Forgiveness is just the release of that emotion that's bonding you to that person. They say the opposite of love is not hate, it is indifference, and that is absolutely true. I don't hate the people that have hurt me. In fact, in some cases, I still love the people that hurt me because some of them are my family. My mother, my father, my brother. They're family. No matter what, unfortunately, I will always love them. <laughs> but for that man in Scotland, for the two people in Arizona, or for the, for the yeah, two people in Arizona, for the two, three people in Florida, I'm indifferent to them. They don't mean anything to me. I'm not angry at them. They'll end up paying the price for what they did, whether they do on this earth or not. They're going to pay that price. And it doesn't rely on me to make that happen. And no matter how much I hate them or deplore them or am frustrated at them or wish them ill, that's not going to change anything. So I had to learn to leave that anger and animosity behind and step into the next life and to let it go. And it was at the point that I learned how to let it all go. That's when I finally figured out how to have a decent, healthy relationship with healthy boundaries. Otherwise, I wouldn't have this marriage that I've got now. And how beautiful that you have that now to reflect on every day to, to recognize how far you've come with those those boundaries and with that growth and acceptance in many ways i see yeah my husband's amazing mm, i'm looking forward to meeting him <laughs> you'll like him he's he is one of the most straightforward people i've ever met mm, and is he an one... east coaster uh no he uh grew up in a combination of oklahoma and tennessee so he's mm -hmm. a southerner okay but he is the firstborn of a household that where he witnessed some some abuse and he knew that he didn't want to be that person and he knew the best way to not be that person is to be straightforward and honest with everybody so they knew what to expect from him at all times and he's never changed from that and i love that about him there was one day i was doing a public speaking event and after we left we were on our way home and he's driving and he said you know i gotta tell you something i gotta be honest with you i was like you're always honest with me why what's up he says, well, in all my years on this planet, you are the only person who has ever accused me of being patient. <laughs> but he's so patient and good with me. I can't help it. <laughs> I'm so glad that you have that support and that you have that partnership. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the big things with trauma is the, the effects very, very intense effects that it has on the human body. You talked a little bit about the effects that it had on your brain at the time. And again, that's very, very common. Um, there's a book, uh, it did not, it didn't start with you. Great book uh, that talks a lot about the impacts of trauma, epigenetics, um, the influence of what happens in the past that influences the present. Um, but one of the big things with trauma is how it affects the physical body, chronic disease. And I'm curious what you have experienced in your physical body um, later on in your life or through these experiences that may be related to have, or I should say that are because of that trauma. Um, and how, how has the trauma affected your physical body? So probably the most um, visible 
difference is my unhealthy relationship with food. Because I had food deprivation in Scotland, my body was then trained that, and my brain were trained to recognize that I need to eat whatever I have in front of me because I don't know when I'm getting my next meal. Because that actually happened quite often out there. I said I'd lost 78 pounds. I have gained all that and then some uh, back since then. (laughs) But I do have a really unhealthy relationship. I have to consciously make decisions to make my portions on my plate smaller to be able to curb myself from overeating. Uh, In 2015, I was diagnosed as having Crohn's disease, which is an autoimmune disease. In 2019, I developed chronic hives. In 2021, it was discovered that I had thyroid disease. These are all autoimmune diseases, and they are all linked, as of 2015, back to trauma. Um, It's also been discovered that I have mold toxicity in my body and uh, Lyme's disease, but the treatments for these things are not recognized by Western medicine. So it was really important to go out and seek somebody who was going to be more holistic to be able to help me with everything across the board. And all when you find us. that, you recognize that all of these people are amazing and they're all going to always point back to emotions and your body's energetics. Always. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, I wouldn't trade my doctor for anything. We have been discussing the possibility of maybe needing to move possibly out of state, depending on how things go in our personal lives right now, because things are in a little bit of an upheaval. If that happens, I'm very happy that my doctor allows telehealth visits because I'm not giving up my doctor. She's amazing. Isn't it so great when you find a doctor that you're just like, I'm not going anywhere in this life without you? Yep, exactly. I if will you don't have that doctor, you guys, go look for them. Yeah. Go find them. Right. It's like shopping for a therapist. Did you know that more than 90% of people lie to their therapist? If you're not going to be comfortable with the person who's there supposed to, supposed to help you, go find somebody you're comfortable with. Don't just sit there and lie to this person. They're not going to be able to do anything for you. They don't have some magic wand to fix everything. It's not That's how it works. Wild. That's wild to me. I don't even know how to lie. Like, it, I just, I can't do it. I, can't, I don't know if it's my Boston blood and and I just, it, it's it's just, it is what it is. Like, you get it exactly how it is with me or like what, but it just, I don't know, man. I just, I don't, I can't do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. You and my husband both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, I, I like to think it's a good quality to have. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. So you talked earlier about forgiveness. And I'm curious how when you stepped into forgiveness, I'm curious how that influenced your physical body and what what did that what transpired for you when you stepped into that? That was a huge difference for me. It was almost instantly where I I made the decision that I was going to forgive. I was going to move on with my life. And that takes some practice. You have to remind yourself every day when you wake up, oh, yeah, I'm not mad at that person anymore. I can let that go. Because if you don't do that, you're going to fall back into your old habits of being mad at that person all over again. But going through that routine of reminding myself every day, I'm not mad at them anymore. I can't be. It's not doing me any good. It's not doing them any good. It's not changing anything. Doing that repeatedly. I started to notice some things with my Crohn's disease. I had been using medication to keep it under control. Eventually, I was able to wean off the medication. I have not needed medication for my Crohn's disease for something like seven years now, eight years. That was huge. And that wouldn't have happened if I was still holding on to all of this anger and this animosity. It's absolutely tied together, 100%. And every time I let go of something else, something else good would happen in my life. A lot of people don't realize that trauma actually is directly connected to your anal sphincter, Mm -hmm. your lower GI. And Crohn's is a lot of that lower GI stuff. And the reason for this is because when we're stressed – when we're holding on to so much trauma, so much negative 
memories, experiences, etc., it leads us to be so stressed and it actually leads us to contract those lower sphincters and causes a lot of tight buttholes really (laughs) to put it simply but there's like a joke in some of my communities that like ah his butthole's tight like (laughs) just call him a tight ass and it has nothing to do with money (laughs) exactly but it's it's true like the body responds when you are holding on to stress and when you're holding on to trauma it responds in hypertension in some way shape or form whether that be tension in your muscles, hypertension with your in within your blood, like your blood pressure, right? Yeah. Your your experience of, for example, something like anxiety, right? Maybe you have thoughts that are all over the place. That's also a symptom of a trauma response. Right. And you know, it's it's odd that uh, I just found out recently that most of the kids that were diagnosed with ADD or ADHD when in the mid to late 80s were children that had survived some kind of trauma. They didn't actually have ADD or ADHD. They did not need the Ritalin. I'm one of those. I was put on, well, my brother was diagnosed as ADD uh, when I was four. He was seven. My mom didn't believe the doctors when they told her that I was fine, so she started breaking my brother's pills in half and giving them to me every day. And a year later, she took me off for a couple of days to take me back in the doctor to make sure that I was pinging off the wall with a drug withdrawal. So they'd give me a prescription, too. Remember, I started getting molested, as far as I can remember, at four. The symptoms that I was showing had nothing to do with needing Ritalin or having that medical diagnosis. Nope. No, nope. there's there's so many symptoms that we see in the world today that are related to trauma. And I think that it's great that the world of trauma is expanding and embodiment is expanding and somatics is expanding. And we have so much more work to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I, I always go back to this. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, I always go back to this this idea that like imagine for, for for anyone listening think about the amount of times that you stood up in school every single day and did what said the national anthem right mm-hmm. imagine if you took that time to instead drop into your body meditate breathe like actually doing things that are going to support your ability to move through the rest of the day rather than reiterate the Pledge of Allegiance or the National Anthem, right? Usually the Pledge of Allegiance, not the National Anthem. But it's amazing to me how much opportunity there is for us to tune into ourselves, how much space there is for change, and we're still not seeing it across the board. Yeah. And... There really is so far that we have to go with all of this, too. I mean, PTSD wasn't even a medical terminology until the 1980s. Thank you, Bessel van der Kolk. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is this is relatively new in the world of science and the world of actual research. We're still understanding all of it. Yeah. And we're just touching the surface. Yeah. And it wasn't until 2015 that autoimmune diseases were linked to early childhood traumas. I mean, these are things that are finally getting addressed. They're finally getting recognized. They're finally having the root cause discovered. When I found out that I had Crohn's disease, they asked, they they said, well, does anybody in your family have it? No. Is it hereditary? Well, we don't know. We don't know what causes it. They had no idea that study had just recently come out saying that autoimmune disease was related to trauma. Most doctors still don't want to recognize that. Because most doctors are taught in a box. Most doctors are taught by a system that is funded by the system. Yep. Unfortunately. But that is changing. And it's beautiful to witness. It's beautiful to be a part of, as I'm sure you can relate to that. And, you know, I'm... I'm interested to hear from you for people that are 
really working on that aspect of forgiveness. And that maybe you know that that's something that would support them, but they're trying to step into that. Because it's hard, right? Forgiveness is oh, not yeah. an easy thing to do. To forgive someone that hurt you and betrayed you, it's not easy. Right. And I'm curious what you have to say and what advice would you give to somebody that is navigating forgiveness? Number one, make sure that you forgive yourself first. Understand that if somebody else hurt you, that's not your fault. It's okay to forgive yourself because you had nothing to do with that. That's a reflection of them, not a reflection of you. And that's huge. That's a, it's a difficult place to start, but it's an important place to start. And when it comes to forgiveness, sometimes what really helps is going through therapy, journaling, writing, painting, getting your expressiveness out there, understanding healthy outlets to be able to express any kind of anger or frustration that you have. Get it out of your body in whatever way fits you that is healthy and comfortable. Get it out of your body. But when you start writing, if you start exploring, why did this person do this thing? Try to understand who they are. And I know that's hard. If it's just a monster, nothing that you're going to do or say is ever going to change it anyway. And if this is a really kind of an average person who's not actually a monster, there's just something wrong with them, nothing you're going to do or say is ever going to change them anyway. Recognizing that and exploring who they are and exploring what your relationship was with them figuring all of this stuff out and giving it a physical body separate from your own that you can set down on a bookshelf and walk away from will help you to not only release your anger, but to understand what forgiveness really means to you. I love those tips and I couldn't agree more. Finding a way to move it out of you. And something I also want to highlight here is that's so important, not just for the past experiences, right? It's like, okay, great. These things happened in the past. Let's write about it. Let's paint about it. Let's do these things to process it. The important part of these practices is implementing them so they support you on a regular basis. For me, that's dancing. Every weekend, I'm dancing. Every Sunday, I show up and I dance my little heart out. I dance all that energy that is no longer supporting my being and I move it. I move it out of me. And whatever way feels good for you, whether that's dancing, whether that's singing, whether that's writing, whether that's painting, whether that's running and jogging and exercising, whatever way feels good for you, give credit to that for it not just being writing, painting, singing, exercising or jogging or dancing give credit to the fact that it's also offering you healing and that it's also supporting you in moving anything that is in your body in your mind out to create the space for a healthy being beautiful so last thing i want to touch on here and i think this is this is Something you brought up earlier around right now your your world is in a little bit of an upheaval in your personal life. Some chaos happening there. And when we were chatting previously, we were talking about the rug being pulled up from underneath you. And in many of the experiences that you shared with us today, there's that theme of, well, the rug was pulled up from underneath you. You were standing on it and then it was gone. And I'm curious what you have to say to someone who is having a difficult time with having that rug pulled out from underneath them. We all have these layers of resiliency in us and sometimes things get really scary and frustrating and we feel like just rolling over and giving up. But that's not the option. That's, that's not the choice. The best thing that we can do in the moments when the rug gets pulled out from underneath us is to stop Take a deep breath, regroup, and form a plan. You know, when I missed that, that flight 
in, out of Scotland, I got really depressed and I nearly took my own life afterward. When really what I should have been doing, saying, okay, well, that one didn't work. What can I come up with now? Sometimes just the planning phase of things will help you to feel like you have a sense of control over it. And as trauma survivors, we do have this trauma reaction known as a sense of need for control. Control what you can and understand that no matter who you are, no matter how much money you make, no matter what part of the world you live in, at some point the rug is going to be pulled out from under you. You could be living on dirt floor or somebody can yank that <laughs> rug out from under you and you're going to land on your butt. It doesn't matter how many times you land on your butt. It matters how many times you get up and dust yourself back off. You've got this. Regroup. And remember that asking for help is not a weakness. It is a strength. And that's why it's so hard to do. Exercise that muscle. Get yourself right on up and brush yourself right on off. <laughs> Keep that momentum going. I love it. <sighs> Thank you so much for sharing all of your experience and your wisdom and for being here and being present. Absolutely. Here on the Mindful Evolution podcast. And with that being said, my last question to you is if there was one thing that you could share with the world to encourage a more mindful evolution in society, what would that be? Focus on educating yourself. One of the greatest ways that I was able to be able to, to move beyond everything that I had been through was educating myself on what trauma reactions are, what the long-term consequences are of not fighting back against them, and what the healthy coping mechanisms I could implement to be able to start fighting back so I could have better health or healthier relationships with people. It's so important that if you have this stuff going on, you need to understand it. You're not going to be able to fight it successfully until you do. What you don't know, you can't change. Yeah. And it's also important to recognize that a lot of people don't know where to turn for help. You know, when I left Scotland, I didn't know where to turn from help. It, human trafficking wasn't something that people were talking about. I didn't know how to ask for help when I was a kid. I didn't have the resources to ask for help. Then, when I was 18, when I was 19, we live in the age of the internet now. Everything is available at our fingertips. If you don't know where to turn for help, Find it, Google it, look it up, and then don't stop there. Reach out for the help that you need. Beautifully said. And if you guys here that are listening are confused and unsure where to reach for help, feel free to reach out to me. I'm sure that Amanda would be very happy to speak with you. You can feel free to reach out to her. I'll put her all her information in the show notes for you. There's plenty of help out there, and alone, you can do nothing. Together, possibilities are endless. So, Amanda, thank you so much for being here, for sharing all of, all of you. I appreciate you so much. And I appreciate you, too. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and we'll talk, talk to you soon.